Hello everyone, um, welcome back to all those who have attended these talks this week, but for those who have not been able to attend, my name is Samantha McCauley and I'm a fourth year History of Arts student at the University of Glasgow. Today marks the end of our talks in Green in Glasgow in the 19th and early 20th century, Art, Health and Horticulture in the Public Park. The talks this week are part of the University of Glasgow's Dear Green Bothy programme for COP26, which overall aims to demonstrate uh, the vital role played by the humanities and arts in understanding and addressing climate emergency. I'm here to cover a few practical points before handing over to Claire and David Mitchell today. I want to start by thanking you all for your patience this week while we dealt with unexpected technical difficulties. New recordings will be made for talks which were particularly de delayed while we attempted to carry on through these challenges and they will be uploaded onto the Dear Green Bothy webpage. Please, if you haven't already, ensure your microphones are muted for the duration of this talk. You're welcome to keep your camera on if you wish, or you may switch it off. As indicated by the sign on screen, the session is being recorded. At the end of the talk today, there will be a short Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat as we go along, or you may wish to post them at the end. We'll be keeping an eye on this and Claire or David will do their best to answer your questions after their talk. Thank you all for putting up with me this week. And now I'll hand you over to Claire and David. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Samantha. Yeah. Well, um, I'm really delighted to, to say hello to David, to, to welcome him. Uh, he's a very distinguished botanist, a former curator at Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh and vice chairman of the National Trust for Scotland, as well as chair of Scotland's garden scheme. So who better really to, talk to you about the history of Glasgow's parks, the kinds of plants they grew, the, the things that they do today. Uh, and I wondered if, David, we, we could perhaps kick off with just um, a little sort of overview. Um, Samantha, I think, is going to share her screen and then we'll have, hopefully, um, a couple of um, introductory slides. There we go. And then a rather dramatic view of Victorian Glasgow, just to remind us um, where these plants were popping up. So, Samantha, can you get to the slide that shows two old photos? It's number three. Um, there we go. Yes, just as a sort of backdrop, because I wanted to ask you, David, what do you think the origin of, of this horticultural heritage we have today in Glasgow, you know, green spaces, parks, tremendous um, appreciation of those and glass houses. And we're going to talk, I think, a little bit more about glass houses today than I've been able to do in my talks. What do you think the origin of, of that Glasgow fervour for, for the green, as it were? Um, actually might be? It's a very interesting question, that, Claire. And I, I don't think there was any one singular cause, but rather it was the coming together of a set of circumstances in a particular way at mm -hmm. a particular time in the history of the city. Uh, undoubtedly, the Victorian desire to understand science and nature, plus their passion for innovation, supported by the wealth generated through global trade and the constant flow of new plants into Britain at that time were key drivers. But in the case of Glasgow, industrialization, including the city's skill set and iron working, engineering, the, the development and manufacture of new technology, be that boilers or radiators or mm -hmm. machinery and equipment, um, trains, engines, railways, all of those skills that was melded with, I think, about concerns among industrialists, wealthy industrialists and, and, and merchants about welfare and living conditions, social well-being, um, and a desire by them to improve the quality of life for others who were not as fortunate as them through philanthropy. There was also a sense of pride and a desire to create something better. To leave, one could even say to leave a legacy or to make a mark. And sometimes that mark seen today in the names that parks carry or oh, in, yes. in the buildings that have been created. If we just take Maxwell Park and the Borough Collection, yes. two uh, instant examples. 
Uh, yes, absolutely. Gosh. And in fact, the next slide, if, if you move on, um, Samantha, we get the Kibble Palace, <laughs> which is um, not named, as it were, after um, a, an individual so much. Well, it is, isn't it, after Kibble, but um, has become synonymous, really, with the Botanic Gardens, the one and the other, a, a great and, and, example. I think it's emblematic of the city's parks. And it would be right to say that, you know, this Victorian glasshouse movement um, was based on engineering, industrial craftsmanship. Um, you know, the city was a strong player in glasshouse manufacture. I wouldn't say it was a leader, but mm -hmm. it did deliver buildings, this wonderful curvilinear structure to stand in the centre of it. I often describe it as being under a crinoline, not as though I ever have, but it's such, it's such a wonderful shape and elegance and curve. And, you know, the history of how that came about is actually quite interesting. And we'll, you know, we'll look at that later, but you've also got other buildings in the city that were built from timber um, and incorporated all that technology. So, you know, Glasgow, although it didn't necessarily set the way with this, it, very much became a you know it became a key player and a leader in certain areas and the Kibble Palace is actually um, part of that legacy and of course many may not know that the site it's on today is not the site that it was originally on it was actually mm. brought up the Clyde on a raft I mean that must have been some site only the Victorians would be bold enough to attempt <laughs> to do something like that and then it yes. was it was reconstructed and in my lifetime. Um, Shipley Engineering took the entire structure to pieces oh. and it was taken away and it was all cleaned and completely rebuilt. So, you know, it, it's very much treasured and loved by the city. Um, and it is a, a representative, you know, a, a really strong representation of the city's industrial and horticultural past. Yes, yes. No, I think that's a really nice reminder, in fact, of, of how, um, you know, how evocative these spaces are. And, and actually looking at this picture, we can just see a few um, plants just next to, to the Kibble Palace. And I wondered if I could go on and, and ask you a little about those 19th century plantings. Um, I think, Samantha, if we could come up with the next slide and then um, there are a few more. But I know they had obviously the, the issues of pollution that we discussed in the talks earlier this week to contend with. W would there have been other things affecting the choice of plants? I mean, up here... Well, we, we I think you've, tu you've touched on the relationship between the atmosphere, pollution, mm -hmm. the climate, um, that influenced what was growing. Mm -hmm. And it, if we look in the history of the planting in the parks at that time, we do see the use of things like oricaria that was popular with the Victorians for its strange shape, liliodendron, mm. maples, oaks, beeches. They had a fascination for variegated plants, including akuba. Um, laurels are also classic of that period. And these things were all mixed together with birch and rowan and evergreens yes. like holly. But they were... Next slide, Samantha. I've got a picture of some of those. Um, yeah, you can see yes. the Douglas fir there. You can see the rowan. We can see oaks. Um, and a number of these species are still found in Glasgow's parks today, um, dating from that time. And also in the corridors that we see between the parks, um, you know, mm. along the likes of the, you know, the Kelvin yes. uh, River, yes. what have you. So, you know, but the gardeners very quickly found that some of these plants, particularly the conifers, weren't happy in parks that were adjacent to industry where the pollution, adjacent mm -hmm. areas where the pollution was particularly bad. And, you know, the, the conifers basically were removed and they were replaced with you know, things that we've discussed, like the liliodendron, the oaks, the maples and the beeches. And it, it's funny, when you look at the fossil evidence that we have today, a lot of these replacement genera and their close relatives have an ancient history that actually yes. places their origin before the end of the Upper Cretaceous and the great extinction event that was known as the KT boundary, roughly 65 million years ago. And at that time, 
the atmosphere on the earth would be high in sulfurs and other pollutants, and the plants that were able to survive that um, thrived and grew. And strangely, and I think totally unwittingly, these are the plants that the Victorians actually used to establish plantings in the industrialized city. They were pollution tolerant. So, yeah. you know, I, but the, it's how they evolved to be like that that has been of interest to myself. Mm, gosh, that is really fascinating, isn't it? And of course, that would chime in with the discovery of those ancient trees in the fossil grove that, that was made I part of the Park. You mm. know, and it, 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 it just links with how the past influences the present yes. over millennia. And that's something that we need to remember today, because mm -hmm. how we act today will impact on how the earth is, not in our lifetime, not just in our lifetime, but in the lifetime of our children, our children's children, and for thousands of years to come. We are the yes. caretakers of this wonderful blue sphere, and our actions determine the platform that it goes forward on. It's quite strange to think that we're now at the point where humanity has the ability to influence climate. Yes, yes, it, it is indeed. If, if we go to the next slide, in fact, there's that wonderful row of beech trees that were planted way back, I think in the late 18th or early 19th century um, at Tollcross Park, which were then incorporated into the park when it became more developed in the late 19th century as part of the city's um, portfolio of parks, if, if one can put it that way. And kind of unwittingly, really, the Victorians were doing what you've just been describing, handing on the past to the future. And we still in, enjoy those trees. They're, they're wonderful, aren't they? Mm. Well, I think that tree planting for the future and the vision to create big parks, big public yes. spaces, open to all, well-managed, you don't build a park in a lifetime, not in no. the sense that we know it. It takes two or three lifetimes for it actually to um, be planted, establish itself, grow and mature. And mm. you know, if one looks at the age of a lot of these trees in our parks, they're now coming into their sensing years. Oh, yes. You know, the, yes. The old yeah. age crashes up with us all, <laughs> sadly. Mm. Oh, dear. Oh, well, um, perhaps actually, if we move on to the next slide, we have some glass houses that are very much feeling their age, unfortunately, in the 21st century, mm -hmm. and they're uh, having to be renovated and, and so on and so on. I, I wondered if you could cast your mind back a little to um, their origins again, and maybe comment on the role they would have had these buildings in the life of the parks and the city. Well, I, th I think when you look at buildings such as the Kibble Palace, um, the Winter Palace on Glasgow Green, um, Queen's Park, Toll Cross, Springburn, and even beyond the city, you know, glass houses at places like Ascob Hall on the Isle of Butte, the Fernery mm -hmm. at Ben Moore, mm -hmm. they played an important role in the life of the city, but in different ways for different sectors of society and communities at different times in their life. They would be places where people would meet they would socialize. They were also places in some cases to be seen. Um, the Hello magazine of their day, I suppose you could put it that way. <laughs> well, that's a know. nice thought, gosh. Um, they were somewhere to go and view the exotic, somewhere to learn, somewhere to enjoy cultural events. Yes. But more than that too, they were also somewhere to escape the reality of life and to mm -hmm. relax and to rest and to, to shelter, especially in inclement weather. And we know all about that at times living in Scotland. Um, yeah. I think also, if you think about the glass house as the beating heart of a park, a destination, but actually the route towards that destination, walking through the park, simply gave you an opportunity to breathe cleaner air and to sit and enjoy, you know, sitting in the sun on the grass. I mean, it was quite interesting to see when we were all able to come out of our homes um, 
during lockdown, how our parks were used and what mm. a magnificent retreat they were for people of all age groups. Um, I think if the last 18 months have taught us more than anything is that we all need nature, we all need to walk. But in an industrial city as Glasgow was at that time, these parks and these buildings would have been particularly important. Um, and, and, and they would have yes. been very special places to go to. There would have been an excitement and an amp and a sense of anticipation as you got on a trolley bus or walked to go towards one. It, yes, oh, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, think of the Winter Gardens where you'd go and see the artworks in the People's Palace and then you'd walk into this wonderland of palms and ferns. Mm. Um, uh, quite, a, as you say, a, a real day out and an experience. Um, how did they actually work? I mean, I, I've got a slide coming up. If you could go to the next one, Samantha, the, there's a sort of picture of an upright tubular um, boiler, which I managed to find that, that was heating all this. And then if you look at that Victoria Regia water lily picture, which we talked about in my talk um, a day or two ago, where the, the heat must have been really quite something to allow this tremendous, um, exciting new water lily to, to blossom and, and a child to stand on the li lily pad. How did engineering horticulture kind of come together in oh. these glass houses? That's, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I think it was, it was the desire to grow plants from around the world and to exhibit mm -hmm. them and for people to be able to enjoy them and touch them and feel them and experience in them was mm -hmm. the driver for that. And we mm -hmm. still have that passion today um, to look and experience plants in the real. We, yes. Something yes. that's deep seated inside us. And it was the determination to do that and the innovation to do that, that brought engineering and cutting edge technology together, whether it's water mm -hmm. flowing about pipes in a boiler or under pressure, or whether it's vents opening. I mean, who except somebody that was completely eccentric would try to put steel glass water, fire, um, mm -hmm. and everything together in a building to grow plants? You know, if you were to talk about doing that now for the first time, I think people would find it very strange. And yet, you know, the Victorians were driven by that. Um, and of course, the technology that they invented for these huge public spaces to display and grow plants was actually in the end transferred in many ways on a smaller scale for the production of commercial crops, such as tomatoes and cucumbers and pot plants and bedding plants and cut flowers. And what was, you know, you know the, the, the Clyde Valley, which was once oh, yes. one of the biggest producers of fruit and veg anywhere in Europe. Gosh. This, this marriage mm. of architecture and engineering and horticulture, it wasn't made in heaven. You know, mm. uh, there's, there's no doubt about that. I mean, the constant needs of the plants, moisture, water, heat, air, light, and, that, and that's not a stable environment, it's an environment that's changing in response to the, you know, the outside conditions, whether it's snowing or, 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 or too hot in the summer, you've got to try and keep it balanced inside yes, the building. Yes. All of that was actually hostile to the building, mm. and it caused the metal work to rust and corrode, it caused, caused the engineering to break down, you know, it, it, yes. they weren't simple things to maintain, and they still aren't. And actually, that sort of juxtaposition of engineering and the needs of horticulture was as much part of the reason for their creation as it was for their downfall. Um, mm -hmm. you know, because you were always trying to balance the two, one against the other, and it, it makes it very difficult um, to do that effectively and efficiently. With modern technology and modern materials, it has got easier, mm -hmm. but there's still a battle. And I, in my years in charge of areas like that, the engineers often used to say to, you know, if we had problems with doing a job and plants got damaged, I always just used to say to people, that's fine, but just remember, no plants, no need for the glass house, no need for the glass house, no need for the engineer, you're out of your job. Uh, you know, <laughs> that was the reality. The plants come first. And you know, I, 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 I think that they, although they come first in a challenging environment, they do, they do give a lot back, you know. But oh, yes. There's a long history to that 
evolution of building and engineering for the purposes of horticulture. And there were a lot of key players in that, involved in that movement as well. There, there were actually, I've got one of them um, on the next screen, um, I think. Samantha, can you move along? Oh yes, there we are. We've got the city engineer, Alexander Beath MacDonald, and he built, or he designed anyway, the winter gardens we were looking at a minute ago. There's a, an interior uh -huh. shop. Um, I wondered if you could perhaps introduce us to a few of these other kind of personalities in, in the glass well, house. Funnily, funnily enough, I think the origins of this is very much the innovation of the writer and publisher from Cambus Lang, mm -hmm. a man called John Claudius Loudon, who invented mm -hmm. the glazing bar. Um, and he worked with a company called W.D. Bailey of Holborn to construct mm -hmm. various glass houses, not only in his own um, greenhouse, in his own garden, sorry, um, mm -hmm. but for loges, which was a nursery in London, and in other locations, including Victon, where you can still see one of the very first curvilinear glass houses that was built in the world. It's a very special structure. So yeah. John Claudius Loudon, without doubt. And then of course, you know, Joseph Paxton. So Joseph Paxton, the garden and designer who built Crystal Palace and was responsible for public parks in Glasgow and Dundee and Dunfermline for their design yeah. and layout. And you, know, you can't not mention Decimus Burton who worked with the iron master from Ireland, Richard Turner, to build the great Pam House at Kew um, and the Temperate House of Kew. But here in Scotland, one of the unsung heroes actually is a man called Sir George Mackenzie. Mm -hmm. And it was actually he that used Loudon's innovative glazing bar mm -hmm. to design a revolutionary curved glass house that was to be placed against a wall for forcing mm -hmm. fruit. And then of course we've got John Kibble and yes. James Butcher and James Coslin and Glasgow's Iron Master James Boyd of Paisley, um, who built the Keeble Palace. And then coming forward in time, you've got companies like Mackenzie and Munker, who were based mm -hmm. in Edinburgh and famed for building um, wooden glasshouse buildings, um, many of which had a huge influence on parks and gardens, both public and private, large and small, mm -hmm. right across the country. Um, you, know, you mentioned Alexander Beath MacDonald. Mm -hmm. I actually think he would have played quite a pivotal role in all of this in mm -hmm. Glasgow. I mean, he was the power broker. I mean, the city fathers, the industrialists, the councillors, the funders, whoever, they would say, yes, it's great, it's a wheeze, let's build a park, that's wonderful, let's put a glass house in the middle of it. We've got the money, and then they would look around and they would look to poor Alexander Beath MacDonald and say, well, make it happen. <laughs> so he was in the mm. position to, uh, you know, to issue and shape the detailed designs, to issue tender documents, to award the contracts, to oversee the build quality. He would have been very empowered, I think, by his employers. And yeah. I think the city owes him a great debt, not just for the work that he did um, and gla with glass houses, but for his work with many other buildings in the city. Um, you know, I, I, yes. I, I'd like to have met him. I think he would have <laughs> been, he would have been quite a tough cookie, but he would have been a very creative person as well. Oh, that's a lovely description. Yes, I'm, I'm sure you're right. He's really the Glasgow equivalent, isn't he, to Alphonse Alphon, who published the great record of his work in Paris. He was the chief engineer and road builder and greenhouse and park designer there. Um, and that's really interesting. Gosh. Well, I wondered, actually, if we just move on to the next slide. Um, I've got this picture of Alexandra Park that I've shown in a number of my talks, where we have this sort of little family group looking out almost like um, spectators at the theatre of the park if you like all these flower beds arranged in slightly geometric um, uh, positions and I wondered if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about these planting arrangements that the, that the Victorians uh, and Edwardians liked out the of doors. And and the Victorians and Edwardians they had this passion for enjoying nature but at the mm -hmm. same time controlling it and using yes. it. Um, and, you know, parterre bedding or carpet bedding, as it was referred to, I'm featured lots of plants from, you know, things like begonias, 
um, to geraniums, calcellarias, fuchsias, violias, even coleus and cannas were popular. And if you look, look, looking in that slide that you have up there today, there's a young monkey puzzle in front of the Kibo Palace. It's just sticking away yes. in the back, you know, and yes. we've got cordylines and dracenes and succulents like agaves and sedums and echeverias were all used. Um, you know, they, they were, these were temporary, they were like living wallpaper. <laughs> you know, I, I often think about them and, you know, they, they, they would also introduce things like chrysanthemums and dahlias and, you know, you, anything that was bright, colourful and would, would transport people to a different place. Mm. And Samantha, it was like that previous <laughs> photograph of the family sitting on the bench. Oh, yes, yes. They're very much in a different world to the world they lived in. And, that, and, and I think that, that may be why a lot of us responded to outdoors and, spa, and our parks and gardens in the way that we did, you know, due, particularly as we went for our daily exercise during lockdown. Uh, yes, I, I think that's absolutely true. It's another world, isn't it? And yeah. um, I, I put this particular picture we've got at the moment up partly because of that, you know, Victoria built this rather splendid private garden down in um, the Isle of Wight for her residence there. And you can see this whopping great agave that's come over from America. It's a little chunk of America <laughs> stuck in her <laughs> garden. Quite, quite amazingly, some of the foundrymen actually made agaves out of bronze Ooh. so that they could still have that shape yes. outside in the winter months when the weather oh. was so inclement that they wouldn't survive. We, we all need shape, form and texture in our life and nature gives us that very richly. Uh, yes, no, that's really interesting, isn't it? Oh my goodness me, they were inventive, those Victorians. Oh, they were, they were <laughs> indeed. Yes, you know, and I, I think they had a they had a real love for everything exotic, you know, orchids, mm. ferns, yes, caladiums. I think the next next slide um, shows some of those. You know, mm. they're all anything that was different looking. We can see orchids here, the aspidistra. <laughs> Did you ever see such a doer thing? You know, <laughs> in a pot. You know. But I'll give you a fascinating fact about it. It's yes. got tiny little purple flowers that appear at ground level. Oh. They're, they're almost insignificant, but they're pollinated by slugs. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh well, <laughs> there we are. The yes. Aspidestra was the epitome of the Victorian drawing room. You know, sitting in a, no doubt, a, a Wedgwood or Dalton jardinier, you know. Why yeah. they have this fascination for things like that? I, I don't know. There's a wonderful mm -hmm. book by Edward Lowe that was published in 1851 that I, I, I've been tempted to purchase on a few times when you can find it, but haven't as yet. It's called Beautiful Leaved Plants. And mm -hmm. it, it, it's just filled with things with weird and wonderful foliage. But, you know, yes. they were so, these things were so venerated. That yes. They were highly illustrated and published and treasured and enjoyed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by everyone um, and anyone because, well, there was no internet, there was no television, you had no way of contact. I mean, even the florists on the corner wasn't there to the same degree. No. And you certainly didn't walk into a garden centre or a supermarket and purchase the wealth of the world's flora as a pot plant. It's interesting to see how many people who don't have gardens are actually re-embracing houseplants mm -hmm. and enjoying growing them and cultivating them and look after them. All of us have got this primeval instinct to grow things. We just have forgotten how to switch it on in some cases, but we're learning mm -hmm. to do that again, which is good. It's good for everyone. Yes, it is absolutely fascinating, isn't it? I think lockdown has indeed opened up a number of these kind of primal dimensions of, of the psyche, as it were. I, I, I think, too, the awareness about climate, climate change yes, has yes. actually made people think deeper about the environment and what they might do to, not necessarily, what they might do to experience it more closely. 
and to have a deeper mm. connection with nature? It, yes, well, um, it, it, it could be that we're on the eve of a whole, you know, revival of, of the glass house and the park and, and everything as part of that. Well, that would be a nice, a nice thing to consider. It would it, indeed. It would indeed. Um, I wondered, kind of moving on from that, actually, if I could ask you to, to say a little bit about our own Sir William Jackson Hooker. There's a picture of him in the next slide because he was professor of botany in Glasgow in the early 19th century before he then went to Kew. So we have a sort of claim on him as one of ours. And I uh, wondered if you... you could say something about how his influence worked through. Mm. Both him um, and his son, um, Sir Joseph mm. Dalton Hooker, I mean, one venerates a little bit, you know, they, they, they were, they were the kingmakers. Mm. It was actually them in the role of directors at Kew and plant explorers and botanists um, who worked with Burton and Turner to create the historic buildings that we see today. Um, Joseph Dalton Hooker, Sir William's son, introduced a plethora of plants from the Far East and the Himalayas in particular. He also facilitated um, others to travel to these parts of the world and many other places, encouraging them to, to bring plants back. He worked with nurseries and nurserymen to do that. He um, pushed uh, matters botanical and horticultural across the country encouraging public interest in native flora as well as exotic flora, and particularly the study of horticultural science through mm. the Royal Horticultural Society. So, you know, they were men of great learning, great vision, huge determination, um, and a voice that's still worth listening to today, very much so. It, they, they believed things could be done and they applied themselves continually to do it, to make sure that we understood and appreciated and had access to the natural world as individuals yes. in a more meaningful way at all sorts of different levels. Uh, yes, I think that that really is um, an important point, isn't it? If you go to the next slide, we've got one of the things that Hooker kind of spread, the rhododendron. <laughs> well, and, um, I mean, ro rhododendrons yes. were, deeply associated with the hookers and I, it's quite interesting that they are surrounded by the kuba and the holly that I me me mentioned earlier and this sort mm. of love of foliage plants mm. um, and I mean the, we could talk for weeks on hookers mm -hmm. contribution to botany and the introduction of rhododendrons it's a whole a whole new topic and you know Scotland as a nation adopted um, with fervor the planting of um, rhododendrons, you know, right across the country. Um, and I think that whole Victorian passion for parks and plants, it was energised, it energised cities, it energised lives, it energised people mm -hmm. here in Scotland, it energised the creation of gardens. And it, it actually was a philosophy that brought art, science, and nature um, closer together. Mm -hmm. It allowed people to have easier access to these things. Um, it helped people to recover from what were serious challenges of poverty and deprivation and social change and industrialization in that era. The, the parks were lungs for lives. And you know the, the hookers yes. and many others realized their, their importance not just for sport, but, you know, actually just as a space to, to breathe. To, to enjoy, yes. To enjoy. And we get we get that kind of slightly more natural um, effect also with the rhododendrons, don't we? If we come into the next slide, there's this sort of semi-wild space at Toll Cross with the rhododendron glen. There's even a deer in an old postcard of it. And then there's Rukin Glen given to the city in the early 20th century where we've got waterfalls and things. Um, and also, I, I think around this and remember that we have one or two interesting women, don't we, popping? 
bringing up, there's Mary Loudon. Is it Mary who's the wife of John Claudius, whom you mentioned? And by this point, the 1904-1910, that there are quite a lot of active women gardeners taking things forward. And I wondered if um, just thinking about the semi-wild spaces, women also involved in gardens, a huge diversity of people enjoying the parks and the glass houses. Um, you, you think there might actually be kind of lessons as we think about the very formal artifice of the greenhouse, the wider space of the park, perhaps involving these semi-wild aspects, the huge diversity of people now involved in horticulture by the late 19th century, women as, as well as men and so on. Do you think there are things we can learn for our, our own society and how we go about um, making gardens central, which is what the city council has said it wants to do as it meets climate change and so on? I think Sorry, I'm a, asking you a lot. It's, really an, it's a really interesting question, though. Um, I mean, you mentioned um, Mrs. Loudon. She actually was as if not more prolific a writer than her husband. Oh. He, hmm. he, had, he suffered quite many challenges from poor health. Oh, yes. um, and I think gardening, I've always thought of it as a great leveler in society. You know, if you bring gardeners together, it doesn't matter whether they're someone who um, is craftsman or someone who you know has a, a job involving maintaining roads and streets and pavements or whether they're an architect or a lawyer or an accountant or a wealthy industrialist you stick them in front of a group of plants that they're all interested in and they all become equal <laughs> yes Park, parks make people from all different walks of life equal they're, they're great social places and the role of women in horticulture, and that's something that's even growing more today. And there are many leading head gardeners um, who are women, many oh. leading authors, television presenters, yes, and others. Gardeners are gardens are family spaces. They are spaces for all. They're spaces for life. But I think this this point about the the semi wild spaces that were created in places like Toll Cross and Pollock. Mm -hmm. and that were planted with native trees and exotic plants. Mm -hmm. Some of that work, including rooted endings, and some of that work being done with people like Sir John Stirl and Maxwell. Yes, um, yes. You know, at Pollock Park. I mean, Sir mm -hmm. John also had a Highland shooting lodge that was close mm -hmm. by the railway line, you know, the, 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 the flagship of industrialization. Now, this shooting lodge was in the middle of Rannoch Moor, of course. <laughs> Couldn't have got somewhere more isolated. Um, mm. And he created a rhododendron Enron garden up at Crowower. And when mm. you think about the sort of scale of the work and the investment and the commitment required to build a park, to build mm. a glass house, to build, you know, how much more eccentric can you be than a rhododendron Enron garden in the middle of Crowower? <laughs> what, what were the drivers behind this, I asked myself. Why did they do it? Was it a need for some sort of escapism? Or was it deeper? Yes. I think it maybe was to a degree. But was it basically the need to create a world within a world? Or in the case of yes. Karawa, a world that was removed? You know, and, and, and it links me back to art and the paintings of Claude Lorraine and Poussong and, and others. This sort of idea to create some sort of Arcadian existence. Uh, yes, in fact, An Samantha, Arcadian lifestyle. Move on. Um, was it? Yes. Was it selfish? No, I don't think it was. I think it was a, a real. I think there really was a strong desire to be philanthropic and to uh, share yeah. the benefits that their industry and efforts had made with others who were less fortunate to create green spaces that would improve the quality of life for everyone. That would uh, yes. give places to rest and recuperate places that would work as engines that would heal people and improve their overall health through exercise and just the, 
the mood change that happens from being yes. outside. I, I agree very much. Um, I've got a couple more slides and I thought maybe if we kind of weave these ideas together as a sort of conclusion almost. Mm -hmm. And Samantha, if you just go on very quickly, we've got an example of the, the craze for ferns, which we mustn't overlook, you know, these monster things that were as tall as trees, um, fascinating uh, development in the 19th century. And then moving on to the last of my pictures of parks anyway um here's the 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 ultimate sort of um place of retreat perhaps um would you like just to say a little david about your your reference to claude lorraine makes me think of arcadia in a way we've got a little miniature world here at the eden project how do these things work today well, I, I, think? I think any glass house it works as a space that allows you to escape the realities of life. It mm. allows you to touch and contact plants that have been transported from across the world. These areas are sort of living treasure chests that, mm. you know, give you a sense of wonder. They do, you know, yes. and, and as you walk and approach them, I mean, even looking at that picture of the Eden Project, I remember the first time I went there, there was quite a sense of anticipation about what you were going to find. Yes, it was yes. Different. It's the same, I think, when you approach any glasses, you're not sure what's going to be in there. How, is it, how hot is it going to be? How cold is it going to be? What's going to be in flower? What's going to be not? It's this mm. thing I saw last time, still alive, etc., etc. You know, they, if you ditch the phone and chill a little, <laughs> just approach these things differently, you realise what a huge reward they can give you and you know you asked about social change i think they were you know they 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 helped with the formation the parks gardens and glasshouses helped with the formation of horticultural societies specialist mm. groups focusing mm. on begonias and chrysanthemums and ferns and orchids and fruit and vegetables you know if you look at this era gardens were central to people's lives and and interestingly i've got quite a few friends younger than me now you know, 20, 30 years younger than me, and they're all moving out of the city because they want a house with a garden. Yes. And, that, and that's something they wouldn't have considered a number of years ago. You know, it, it's come about in the last couple of years. They, they want to be able to sit outside. And the Victorians knew and respected the benefit from that. I mean, I, I, look, at, I look again at the Eden Project, and I think, is the Glasshouse some sort of museum for plants? Mm. Yeah. It may well be, but, you know, you, we spoke about the People's Palace earlier. I mean, who but the Victorians would take an art gallery and actually stick a greenhouse on the back of it? <laughs> well, no, no, nobody would do that in their right mind. And yet what you've got is this fusion of all the things that drive culture. You know, fact, I think, yeah. you know, if you, if you go back and you think about people like Patrick Geddes and, you know, Patrick Geddes, wonderful quote, this is a green world. Mm. with animals few and small and dependent on leaves by leaves we live you know and we, 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 we mustn't forget that plants consume carbon carbon dioxide and release the oxygen that we breathe you know plants are the givers of life that's it and you know the eden project is a modern glass house that acts as a visitor de destination that's regenerated the economy in that part of the country, built in a brownfield quarry site that's become a magnet to help us better understand and be fascinated by the world of plants that's all around us. I mean, if you were actually to get up in the morning and make a list of all the plants that you use in the course of a day, you'd be quite shocked. <laughs> Every time I've done it, I always manage to get to about 120. I mean, if you take lipstick alone, it's got five different plant products in it, many of which are the same as the shoe polish I clean my shoes with. Okay. <laughs> then if you think about something as simple as a newspaper or the orange juice that you drink for breakfast or the cereal that you eat, or the milk. Mm. The milk's not possible without the grass because the cow has to eat the grass to make, you know, where mm. everywhere you go, the jojoba shampoo on your hair, that, the, the list is endless. They're all around us. The clothes we wear, everything. 
you know, we, by, by leaves we live. And, you know, I think what the Eden Project does is it's a great place to visit, as is any glass house, but it reignites that passion for plants that we need and we all have. And we need them now more than ever as we set to to embark on tackling climate change and, you know, other challenges in society to do with mm -hmm. health and well-being as a result of the pandemic. You know, plants are the engines of life and greenhouses and parks are places where that life can be accessed by all and hopefully better understood by all. And, you know, botanic gardens and historic gardens, and they all play part, part in that. I mean, I often think about the sort of history of Scotland from a horticultural perspective. We've been growing plants since the time of the formation of the Abbey by St. Columba on Iona. We have over a thousand years of being some of the best plant cultivators and growers anywhere in the planet, if we go back to the Bronze Age. And we certainly have got 600 years of horticultural history in Scotland that we can access readily and easily today. And of course, all of these parks, gardens, glass houses, etc., they inspire artists. It, they do. And actually, I think we're going to have to draw to a close. But if we perhaps put up the final slide in the little group, we've got just a reminder of how they inspired the Glasgow boys here. And the next one shows um, the Scottish colourists. Um, so would it be a good moment to perhaps just turn to the audience now, if we finish sharing the slides, Samantha, and turn back to um, the the people present. I'm sure there are questions coming up. Uh, we've had such a fascinating talk with, with David. I've thoroughly enjoyed, gosh, we've spread right across the world, across society, <laughs> into engineering. Um, every dimension really comes together, as you rightly say, in, in the growth of the garden. Um, there are questions, I think, coming up in the chat, aren't there, Samantha? Let's see. Someone's um, asking about the extravagance of the garden at Karua made just because it could be done. We have billionaires sending each other into space because they can. Do do you have any thoughts on that idea, David? Uh, that... I think he wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. If we look at that era, there are around 60 to 80 gardens that were established around the west coast of Scotland um, mm. for the cultivation of plants from across the world. At that time, they employed um, a lot of local people who might have had to have moved away from the area to find employment in another way. They, um, in many cases, became great historical assets. I mean, if you, take, if you take the impact that I often think about the creation of the garden at Inverview, mm. that that had on actually creating a magnet at that end of the peninsula, um, for people to travel to, you know, for many, many years, long after Osgood and his daughter's time. Um, mm. You know, I, I, I'm not And so John Sterling Maxwell's case, he experimented a lot with forestry um, mm. at Karawa, and that, yes. was the, that was the main driver for it. And then it was having seen the success of the forestry that he then thought, well, if they'll grow here, I might as well try some rhododendrons because I've got them anyway. And the rhododendrons were popped in among the forestry plantations. And it's quite, it's actually quite incredible what's there. And many yes. of the plants that are there today um, are quite important scientifically. And, and that is the only location where some of them were. Um, and they're now being propagated and reintroduced um, in, in, into other gardens elsewhere. So mm. th there's a much bigger picture behind all of that. It was an extravagance, but it was an extravagance that was designed so that he could learn by it. Mm -hmm. And it was an extravagance that created employment and jobs and you know, ultimately, in some cases, stabilized and developed communities. Um, yes, that, that's really fascinating. Well, well, someone has commented, in fact, or asked what lessons do you think these past ambitious Nanslick 
planning examples could bring to the current ambitions for Queen's Park becoming a pollinators park and the newly plied, newly planned Clyde climate forest. Those, those are interesting ways really, aren't they, of some of this ambition working through in our own times. I think the, for me, the key thing is regardless of the themes, it's to make sure that Glasgow's parks remain relevant to all aspects of people's lives, that they're appealing and safe mm -hmm. and accessible for people of all age groups, ethnic groups and abilities, that we continue to use them to relax in and for cultural activity. And if that also includes securing, and it should include securing biodiversity and celebrating pollinators. And, you know, mm -hmm. if we use them as what they were designed for originally, lenses on the world, that improve the quality of life for all, then I'm I, I'm all for it, you know, um, <laughs> very, very, very much so. Um, I think these things are very important, especially when you have a workforce that's very likely going to be based at home yes. more than ever before, to the point that some individuals may actually not go out for two or three days because they don't have to walk to work. Mm. They don't have to get the bus. They don't have to cycle. They don't even have to go out to shop because it's all delivered. Yes. So we need to find ways to encourage people to want to go out, to be out, to exercise, to live, to breathe, to mm -hmm. be in contact with nature. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure that the city will continue to do what it's always done, and that is to invest in its green space and to build and maintain a green world within an urban world going forward. Mm -hmm. You know basically creating a place to live where history is a ship not the anchor a city that grows and nurtures its children and its adults and its elderly over a lifetime using the engines of its parks and gardens to do that and allotments and Glasgow's always been a leader in this field and I'm, I'm sure yes. that you know for many reasons it will continue to develop and grow and continue to be that challenging though it is in difficult economic times. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yes, no, I'm, I'm sure you're right. Um, I'm just noticing popping up in, in the chat an interesting couple of questions. Someone talking about the um, extent to which academic debate on the issue of native plants became um, uh, an important factor, should they be grown rather than exotics, and someone also asking about how the Glasgow Park should deal with the decolonizing agenda, you know, given that Pollock was owned by people who eventually, back in history, had plantation interests and so on. Um, I, th I think these are very, very, very interesting questions, and they're important questions. We need to be mm -hmm. honest about our past. We mm -hmm. need to be honest about history. We need to respect the role of indigenous people. I mean, I know from my own experience in working overseas collecting, none of that would have been possible without um, the assistance received from ind indigenous communities. It's quite mm -hmm. interesting to note too that just recently there's been some work done to recognize all the collectors, uh, the, the native collectors who worked closely with George Forrest. So to me, it's about being honest, transparent, and respectful. Mm -hmm. And, 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 to, yeah, and yes, to be honest, and to a degree, accepting that the world we live in today is different from the world that they lived in then. Mm -hmm. And that this reawakening of respect and rebalancing of life um, mm -hmm. is is connected with that. It's part of that evolution of change. But you know, I, mm. I think these are these are good and and you know very valid questions. We can't hide from history, but we can't change it either. And nor and, and we shouldn't try to do either. No, no, that, that's a really interesting perspective. I mean, it, it certainly I'm sure we wouldn't have most of these plants if we hadn't worked with native people in, in various ways. Um, I'm just looking, time's marching on. Samantha, I know you've been looking at the chat more in detail than I have. Are there any big questions we've missed, do you think? Um, I realise that we're running a little over time and we probably ought to um, try to draw things to a close. Fascinating though it all is. I'm so grateful to you, David, for taking the time trouble. 
No, you, you, you're very welcome. I, I'm just looking at the chart as well. And there's a question about the balance between exotic plants and native plants. Oh, that's one right. of the really yes. good things that's happened recently is we now have a very good, strong list of alien plants that were introduced at that time that yes. it's now illegal to grow and to cultivate. Um, and we, um, we have to bear all of that in mind. Both have a role to play now, just yeah. as they had a role to play in the Victorian era. And we are very fortunate now it is that we have a much greater understanding of what we're introducing and the damage it can do than, mm. they, did, than they did then. Yes, gosh. Well, I think we have pushed the boundaries of the time slot as far as we can. Um, it's been brilliant talking to you, David. Thank you so much. And I really am looking forward to listening to the recording of all this and, and following it all in detail again myself. But we will try and put that plus um, uh, a, a re-recording of the lectures that got interrupted by our technical woes on Monday, Tuesday. No, it was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's right. We'll put all them on the Green Bothy website and um, please feel free then to come and, and in, enjoy them hopefully again. Thank you to David. Thank you to Samantha. Thank you to the audience. Um, I hope you'll go and enjoy the Glasgow Gardens with renewed vigour from now on. <laughs> I certainly will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Claire. It's been a, a pleasure as always. Oh, thank you. Thank you.